2 Peter 1 and verse 12. <clears throat> Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. Father, thank you for your word. I pray as uh, your word goes forth this morning, you would uh, guide me, fill me with your spirit, use me, and Lord, may your spirit work in the hearts of each one here, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, the year was 18... Um, 92, and Catherine Lee Bates uh, was a school teacher at the time, and she visited Colorado, um, actually to teach summer school, and she had some time to um, summit the 14,000-foot peak um, called Pikes Peak near Colorado Springs, um, Colorado. She actually, uh, when I read about it, they actually, there's a road up there now, but they actually got part of the way up, um, maybe by a railroad, and then they took mules the rest of the way uh, to get to the top. So it wasn't quite easy, as easy back then. But, um, but here's what she said. She said, um, I was very tired, but when I saw the view, I felt great joy. All the wonder of America seemed displayed there with a sea-like expanse of fertile country spreading away so far under those ample skies that the opening lines of the hymn, America, that we just sang, America the Beautiful, floated into my mind. When we left Colorado Springs, the four stanzas were penciled uh, in my notebook. And hence um, that wonderful hymn, which, um, which we sang uh, this morning. Uh, so... Um, last Sunday was a great, great service. Um, you folks that were here last Sunday, it was a wonderful time to see Pastor Steve um, installed as Faith Bible Church's new pastor. Um, I actually missed the first Sunday he was here back in April. I was traveling at the time. I did see it out of Zoom, uh, uh, on Zoom, however, that, that Sunday back in April. But um, this morning... Pastor Steve is uh, yielding uh, the pulpit to me. Uh, we spoke a little bit uh, during the week, and basically out of abundance of caution as he continues to recover from his um, health crisis last Sunday. And if you say, what health crisis are you talking about? Either you don't read emails as often, like I don't myself. Sometimes I'm three or four days behind. But... Um, or you don't get the emails, or whatever, you just um, uh, don't know. Last Sunday uh, evening, and this is, the, this is the short version, because there were emails that went out for several days, or, or, or several times those couple days. But, um, but Pastor spent the night in the hospital. His um, heart went into atrial fibrillation, AFib for short, um, he was in and out of consciousness. He was rushed by ambulance to the hospital. Um, we prayed for him. Uh, Don was able to uh, go there and, and um, stay uh, that night. Um, so thank you, Don, for that. And I know a lot of you folks reached out to them uh, during the week. It was good that at the time they had family still here um, around so to rally around them. But he was in overnight, and um, they released him on Monday. And after that, uh, he's been slow to recover. His heart rate is still high, still in AFib, still gets um, winded, um, especially as you probably noticed he was uh, sitting for, uh, when we were standing for the songs, he was sitting just to um, rest. He's not allowed to drive for, for a week, um, I think, maybe longer. But the good news is he's going to see his doctor on Tuesday. He's going to see a specialist, heart specialist on Thursday. And uh, we trust that um, we'll be able to um, figure that out. So uh, you're welcome to see him or see Kendra with any more questions. I know a few of you have talked to him this morning. But, um, um, <coughs> but imagine, 
Um, next Sunday, um, trusting that pastor will be back in the pulpit next Sunday, that um, he tells you to open a Philippians chapter 1, and he preaches that same message he preached six weeks ago, back in April. And then the following week, he goes on to the next message that he preached uh, five weeks ago. And the next week he preaches, you know, and he goes through those same five messages he preached from Philippians. He just repeats them over again um, in June. And then at the next deacon board meeting, there's a deacon board meeting this week, but at, at a future deacon meeting, the deacons say, Pastor, why are you preaching the same messages over again? And he says, well, as soon as the folks around here start doing half the stuff that I've been preaching, maybe I can stop repeating myself. <laughs> <laughs> and in 1 Peter chapter 1, that's what Peter's doing here. You know, the importance of drilling it into someone's head over and over again. Uh, I remember a time I watched a movie, and I, I sung that song. Let's see, where's my book? Um, I sang that song, America the Beautiful, this morning on purpose um, because we just got over our Memorial Day weekend, and I wanted to just keep that theme going a little bit. By the way, um, Pastor um, Daryl last week, many names. Uh, Pastor Darrell last week recognized the uh, veterans. Um, he himself was a veteran, uh, if you didn't know that. So, um, And also Jen Saylor is, so make sure you thank Jen uh, this morning. But I uh, watched a movie one time, and it was based on this book called um, Sergeant York and the Great War. And if you've never seen the movie, Gary Cooper might have been. Um, oh, I think it says on the back of the book. Um, yeah, portrayed by Gary Cooper in the in the movie, but um, but Sergeant York actually in Germany, in during World War One, um, pretty much. Uh, so he was a uh, he got saved as an adult and and believed killing was wrong and didn't want to go into war because of killing. Uh, he didn't want to kill, but he ended up being drafted and going into the war. And he ends up capturing, with very few casualties, pretty much single-handedly, 132 Germans. Um, because he was such a good sharpshooter, and they knew that, okay. And, and it was ma amazing when you read it, and, and you could either read about it in his biography. But I was watching, uh, the point is, I was watching the movie, and I said, I need to watch this movie, because last time I watched it, um, I, didn't, I didn't see the whole thing. And I'm watching it, and I'm like, oh. Yeah, I remember that. I guess I did see this movie before. Oh, I remember that. I guess I did see that movie before. Oh, I remember that. And I just needed to be reminded. I just needed to see and hear again to be reminded about what I had forgotten. And that's the idea this morning behind these verses. Look at um, verse 12. Um, three times in just four verses, Paul uses that word remembrance. He says in verse 12, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. In verse 13, uh, at the end of the verse, putting you in remembrance. In verse 15, that ye may be after my may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Oh, and I might have uh, I might have those words up here. Oh, yeah, here they are. Um, sorry about that. I forgot. I got a clicker here. Um, to have these things always in remembrance. <coughs> By the way, last weekend, um, I was able to thank, um, uh, pay my respect and thank uh, veterans at two parades, and I was unexpected. I, I was driving through Goshen on my way home last Wednesday about 3 o'clock, and the traffic was stopped. I'm thinking, they don't, have a, they don't have a parade on Sunday in Goshen, do they? And sure enough, the parade in Goshen is on Sunday. And uh, so I said, well, I'm going to find a place to park, and I'm going to get out, and just as the soldiers were walking by, I was able to, you know, uh, clap my hands for them. And uh, the parade in Goshen is um, not very long, but um, <coughs> but let me tell you, it's longer than the one in East Heartland. You ever been to the one in East Heartland? <laughs> that one is probably shorter than like the walk from here to the Y, which I do, which I did uh, this morning. It, literally, it's that short, um, but it's still a wonderful parade. Uh, but in any case. 
Uh, and then on Monday, I was able to see the parade here um, in Winstead before heading up to um, heading up to the picnic. Anyway, back to our text. Um, um, what are the these things that we're supposed to be remembering? Right, that's the idea. Right? I, I can say, oh, you need to remember that. Well, Paul, Peter's speaking about something specific. So we're going to back up a little bit, um, and we're not going to take time in one message to go through this whole chapter in detail, but um, just kind of a quick overview to get back to, our, uh, to those text verses. So um, back to verse 1. Uh, the Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to uh, give his um, kind of a uh, introduction to his to his book. But I love that phrase there that I have highlighted. Um, beautifully poetic. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Boy, that's the most important question for you this morning. Have you obtained that like, precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ? If you're not sure of the answer, if you're not sure that God has saved you, then let his spirit prick your heart. Let his love, let his grace uh, 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 invade your soul, the only way for you to be righteous before God, the only way for anyone to be righteous before God is to uh, allow God to save you, allow him to birth you into his family when you trust him uh, for eternal life. And once you're saved, he talks about promises um, that we're to have. And he, and uh, well, let, let me just read the verse. So he says, um, Verse 4, whereby are giving unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we may be, but might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corrupt, corruption that is in the world through lust. Then he goes on in verse 5, he says, okay, once you have that saving faith, once you are saved, once you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you need to um, um, do four things with it. He says you need to add some things to it. He talks about abounding. He talks about an absence of it, and then he talks about some actions, all leading up to our text verses about remembrance. So what do I mean by that? So he says, okay, first of all, I want you to add to your faith, verse 5. And he gives a list of things. And I, I, could, take, I could take a message in each one of these. So we're just going to look at the list. He says, add to your faith, virtue. And then add to virtue, knowledge. And then add to knowledge, temperance. And add to temperance, patience. And godliness. And brotherly kindness. And charity. He's saying, add all these things to your faith. Um, uh, virtue, moral, um, moral power, vigor of the soul, knowledge, insight, understanding. Notice he puts the morality before the education. You know, vir virtue, then knowledge, temperance, um, self-control. You might your your uh, version may say self-control, patience. Boy, do I need patience? Ask my Sunday school teacher. Uh, ask my whoops. Ask my uh, Sunday school class this morning. Um, we all had to talk about times when we could have done better in certain areas. And um, where's Mr. Collins? I, I told them about that incident a few weeks ago, Mr. Collins. So, um, but um, um, godliness, brotherly kindness, right? That's that word Philadelphia, brotherly love. Um, and then uh, charity, which is what the King James uses often for that word agape, that love that God wants us all to have. So he says, add these things to your faith. These are the things, by the way, he's talking about remembering. Um, and then he says, um, um, if these things are in you and abound, they make you. So we have these things in you. Then he wants them to abound. And oh, look at that, it's working. They figured if I put in some, you know, these crazy graphics, then it'll distract from the message, and you'll just look at the crazy graphics. So, um, my I was babysitting last night, and my granddaughter woke up. At, I don't know, it was late, and she came out crying because her parents weren't home yet. And I sat on my lap, and I said, and I said, "Hey, watch this." I was just finishing this up, and I said, "Watch this." And she, her eyes like opened up. Wow, that's so great! You know? Um. 
the word abound, it means to um, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, 1, 3, Paul wrote that your faith grow exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. It means to make more, to increase, to grow. He says he wants this virtue, knowledge, temperance, not just to be in you, but he wants it to abound in you. <clears throat> Um, that's verse number um, uh, verse number eight. These things being you in a bound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in a knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be you want to be fruitful. Let these traits abound in you. Then he goes on to say, but if you lack these things, what things? If you lack these things, virtue, knowledge, temp, right? If you don't have them, if they're absent from your life. If they're gone from your life, what does he say? Verse number 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and for has forgotten that he was purged from his sin. So if you're lacking virtue, lacking knowledge, li right, they're gone. Where are they? They disappeared. He said you're going to be blind. There's blind. He said you're going to be blind. You're going you're gonna to be uh, short-sighted or near-sighted, not see far off. That, that word literally, we get our English word myopic from it or, or somebody who is, oh, Jennifer would help me with that, right? She used to work as, as, as an, uh, in an optician's office, right? But I think that means you're, you're near-sighted. Um, um, cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged. You know, he's, he's forgetful. Boy, have I forgotten, you know, if, if I wake up in the morning and I say, oh, woe is me, boy, I've forgotten that I've been um, purged from my old sins, that Jesus Christ has saved me, Jesus Christ has washed me clean of my sins, that I have a, an eternity with him because of what he has done for me, uh, I can just be thankful for that. And then he says in verse 10 that you need to do these things. In, in our uh, teen class in Sunday school this morning, we were talking about that very thing in James, be you doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Um, practice them, uh, 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 um, have actions, put them into action. Verse number 10, wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure for the, if you do these things, if you do what things, the virtue, the knowledge, the temperance, right? If you're practicing these things, if you're, if you're exhibiting in your life, it's going to be an evidence of your salvation, um, Again, we're not going to get into deep theological discussion of, of this verse, but um, the Bible says to make your calling and election sure, and then it says ye shall never fall. So do these things, evidence of being saved, and it's going to keep you on the right path. So, so here's Peter saying, add to your faith virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. And then he says, now, I want you to remember them. Now, I want you, here's the things that I want you to remember. And he says, there's three ways I want you to do it. Three ways for you to remember these traits. Um, number one, you need to do it carefully. Carefully. Why do I say carefully? Verse 12 says, wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Um, there's a double negative there. I will not be negligent. That word negligent um, is a word that, um, it's, it's a, the, the Greek word before it is the, word, is the letter a, ah, which means, which is the word for no or don't do this. And it's a, ah, and then it's maleo, which means to care. So it means, so that word negligent means don't care or not caring or, uh, you know, negligent is the idea behind the word negligent. But then he says, don't be negligent or don't be not caring. So if you just cross out the two negatives, he's saying be caring or be careful. He says be full of care, be full of care. That's the idea behind that word. So, so Peter's saying, I'm going to be careful to tell you this. And careful to tell him what? He says, to put you always in 
remembrance, always, perpetually, incessantly. I'm going to tell you over and over again to put you in remembrance, to remind you. Um, the idea behind that word, um, to put you in remembrance, it's, it's, it's a single word. That word, put in remembrance, is a single word, a uh, big, big, huge word. Hupo mimnexco. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big word in Greek, and I'm not going to try to... Um, but anyway, um, literally, it just means to to remind, to put to put it into mind, to to um, uh, get you to remember this very carefully. <clears throat> He's saying, but he just told he he just spent the whole first part of that chapter saying about all these things. Um, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, all these things to, to, uh, to, to do and don't neglect them and, and make sure you have them and make them abound. And he says, you know what? I've got to still remind you again and get just like that pastor, just like next week. So if you get to Philippians 1 next week, you're going to know why. But just like over, why you have to be reminded? Well, Peter's doing the same thing. He says, you know what? I'm going to put you in remembrance. And this is the first time he says it. Because look at verse 13. He says, yea. Um, he kind of gets excited about it. He says, yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this, my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. So he's like, shortly, I may not be around here anymore. So in the future, you know, I, right to my dying days, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to stir you up. That word stir, it literally means um, to awake, to arise, to, to shake somebody and wake them up. Matthew 4 and 38, the Bible says, and he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him. That's the word stir. Can you imagine that? They're in the ship. This is the story when the, when the whims were going, and, and, they're, and Jesus is there sleeping in the ship. And the, Can you imagine? Wake up! We're going to perish! That's the idea behind that. Verse 39, And he arose. He was stirred. Uh, Luke 8, 24, And they came to him and awoke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish! Um, <clears throat> on Tuesday, in two days, I have a, um, a dentist appointment. And I remember one time I was at this dentist, and he was working on my teeth. And it must have been at the end of a very tiring day or a tiring week. And I'm, ah, uh, uh, I got a head out in the eye. And also my eyes are closing. Uh, my mouth is closing. And I start and I start falling asleep in a dentist chair. <laughs> and he says, and, he, and as, as my jaw is closing down on, her, on his dental equipment, in, inside my mouth, you know, open wider, open wider, he says, and I wake up. Um, I need to be aroused out of my sleep. <coughs> I was gonna, I was gonna give this to one of the, uh, one of the teens, but, um, but we'll try it here uh, to see if it works. But right, when you hear one of these things, it gets you. Right, you hear it. You arise. Whoa, I got to be awoken when, when so hopefully it stops. But, um, <coughs> okay, who's been sleeping? Did I wake you up? <coughs> Peter says, I'm going to stir you up. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to shake you till you remember this. Yeah, I think of me as long as I'm, in, uh, as, long as I'm in this tabernacle, verse 13, to stir you up, putting you in remembrance. And he says, why? Because knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, I may not be around here to stir you any longer. So I'm going to stir you now while I can. So he showed carefulness. He did it carefully. He did it excitedly. And then he did it diligently. He says, moreover, verse 15, I will endeavor that you may be after my decease. So now that's, now that's even after he's gone. <clears throat> to have these things always in remembrance. That word endeavor. Um, uh, it's a word often translated 
diligence or diligent or to give diligence. So that's how I got the word diligently. We need to be, we need to be diligent. And and and, and uh, Peter here, he was ge- he was telling them, you know what? I'm going to be diligent. I'm going to remind you over and over again. Even even after I'm gone, I'm going to remind you. And say, and how is Peter going to remind him after he's gone? Well, I find it very uh, interesting. If you read the rest of the chapter, he starts talking about the eternality of God's word of which this book would then be part of right as he's writing it um, it's not going to be it's not going to be um, written for us to keep for all time uh, look at verse 16 for we've not we have not followed cunningly defined fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and were eyewitnesses of his majesty so he starts talking about uh, there was a time when Jesus spoke to me directly when he was transfigured and he basically these next couple of verses, he recounts himself along with James and John being at the transfiguration back in the back in, back in the Gospels. And he says, but you know what? Verse 19, we got even something better than that, better than Jesus talking directly to me at that time. He says, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. We're into you, do, we're into ye do, do, do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and that day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scriptures is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Here it is. Here's the word of God. It was spoken by the Holy Ghost through men of God, just like it was at that time, that very letter that he is writing to these uh, to these Christians would now is now part of that very word of God. Folks, we need this word constantly, diligently in our memory. I was telling the I, I when did I mention it? Um, I don't know, I mentioned it to somebody. But um but, oh, it was Wednesday night. That's right, Wednesday night. I'm like, I was at this pulpit. When was I at this pulpit? Um, that's right, Wednesday night during prayer meeting. Um, I also led um, led the prayer meeting service. And uh, I was a little convicted that I'm studying, we're studying the book of James in the uh, teen Sunday school class. And I was at a graduation the previous Friday at a Christian school where my uh, niece graduated. And she, by the way, first in her class. Um, but the speaker at the graduation mentioned he was the Bible teacher from the school and mentioned that the high schoolers had been taught the book of James recently. And one of their assignments was to memorize James chapter one. And I said, wow, you know what? I'm teaching that. I'm going to memorize James. So I started to memorize James chapter one. Why? Because because here it is. I if, if I'm going to get a constant reminder, especially I need that James chapter one, but you doers of the word, not hearers only, um, um, it, which also says, see, I don't have it memorized. Um, oh, wherefore, my brethren, be ye swift to hear. You know what the next words are? Slow to and slow to. Yeah, slow to anger. So um, I said, boy, I need to be reminded of that one. And um, so there it is. Just allow that word, that engrafted word, to, to, to be in your life, to, to be constantly reminded of it. Diligently um, put it in remembrance. <clears throat> I started out the message um, talking about honoring those who lay down their life to preserve our freedoms. Uh, that's why we have Memorial Day. That's why um, ever since I was a kid, when my mom used to take me to Memorial Day parades um, and grained in me, you know what? This isn't just a day for uh, a day off of work or a day for picnics or a day to, um, uh, it, but it's a day to remember, hey, this is why we have Memorial Day. This is why we're, we're remembering those who laid down, um, laid down their life for us. John, Um, 15 and verse 13, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life um, for his friends. And 
So I think I have another little uh, thing if you click it again. So if you click it again, it'll do this. Um, but um, but this is a uh, gravestone. I tried to make it bigger so you could read it, but you probably still can't read it very well. Um, this is actually a, um, a cross that is in the Netherlands. Um, it's at a cemetery called the Netherlands American Cemetery um, near the uh, city of Maastricht. Uh, the city is called... Um, well, I'll think about it in a second. But in any case, um, this um, is a grave of my uh, mom's brother. Um, he uh, laid down his life uh, in World War II and um, died about, well, about a month before the war ended in Europe. Um, he was in uh, Germany uh, fighting. They were closing in on Berlin. Um, um, ironically, and uh, died there and is buried along with 8,300 other soldiers at the cemetery. And when I was in the Netherlands four years ago, um, I said, I am going to find this cemetery and find this grave, and I did. Um, and it was a real, special, um, a real special time, not just because I saw the grave, but, um, but while I was there, the folks in the Netherlands um, they rolled out the red carpet. When family comes to this cemetery and they know about it, um, they roll out the red carpet for you. The, the grave is actually sponsored by a family in the Netherlands. Um, um, I'll give you their first names anyway. Um, Hank and, and Karen, H-E-N-K, um, and Karen. And they uh, live over there nearby. And what does it mean that they sponsor the grave? And by the way, every grave in that cemetery is sponsored by a different family, and there's 200 people on a waiting list to be this sponsor. And what they do is they bring flowers, and they care for the grave, because I can't, because I'm over here, um, and family can't, because they're so thankful. They call us the liberators, um, even today. Um, and I met Hank and Karen when I was there. It was a, uh, a fabulous time. But they had a special ceremony um, at the grave. And, um, but you know what? Uh, and, and notice, by the way, that the grave, along with all the ones behind it, perfectly in, in a line, um, is in the shape of a cross. Um, and most everyone at that cemetery is in the shape of a cross. And yes, he did lay down his life so that um, we can have the freedoms. And we need to think about that and remember that when it comes to Memorial Day each year. But even more important than that is that cross reminds us of what Jesus did when Jesus died on that cross. You know, Peter started out saying, add to your faith. Folks, we need to have that faith. We need to put that faith in what Jesus did for you on the cross. If you haven't done that, if you haven't put your faith in what Jesus did for you um, on that cross, then, um, then that's the first. That's where it all starts. Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood. He paid the price for your sin that you might have eternal life. And that's the greatest love that anyone can have. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity this morning to be reminded. Lord, P uh, Peter said three times, I want to put you in remembrance. I want to put you in remembrance of these things that I've taught you. And Lord, may we be constantly reminded of these truths from Peter, of these truths from your word, and most importantly, of the truths of the gospel. I love to tell the story. Father, we sang that earlier, I love to tell the story. And Lord, that story never gets old, the story of what Jesus did for me on the cross. And I pray if there's someone here this morning that doesn't have that assurance of eternal life, that this morning they would place their faith and trust in Jesus. They would realize that he died on the cross. He paid um, the penalty when he paid for it with his life, with his blood, with his shed blood, for the remission, for the forgiveness of our sins. Bless now as we close this service, uh, singing a praise song to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As Ryan makes his way to the piano, I'll ask you to stand and we will sing about those wonderful words. Uh, 270.
you'd like to use your hymnal. 270, if you'd like to use your hymnal. Beautiful words, wonderful words of life. Thank you. 